Good afternoon, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Yes, I think we are afternoon technically now. Uh, so our topic discussion today is about China and Africa. And to be more specific, it is about how China is changing the game of foreign trade and investment in Africa. But, so I have to be honest about, uh, with you about that. Actually, I was in the career dome watching the game Clemson, the Clemson Tigers destroy our Syracuse defense <laughs> in our first ACC game ever, football game ever. And seeing the powerful offense of Clemson uh, carving up huge slices in our defense somehow had me thinking about investment and trade in Africa. And I was like, yeah. If you put the metaphor of the game and try to go over it, it might be a powerful tool to understand and to frame actually what's going on uh, uh, about uh, trade and investment in Africa. And to see the huge and wonderful uh, change that are going on, and at the same time, to see how pivotal a role China has been playing in, in, the, in that change. Uh, well, and to finish about the game, actually, I was quite happy despite the fact that we lost, because I was like, OK, if somebody walked around, he would be thinking that I was just here watching a game and slacking my time away. And actually, I'm solving real problems in Africa. So I, was, I think it, I was doing some, something useful. But the point is, why does it matter? And I mean, uh, why does it matter to know about how China is changing the game of trade and investment in Africa? And why does it matter to you? Uh, the fact is that uh, this can be used as a paradigm and a benchmark for foreign trade and investment strategy in developing countries in general, because you have quite a huge bulk of them in Africa. Uh, you have traditional actors, and you have different kind of actors. So what we'll try, what we'll, we'll try to do is consider what's happening in Africa, but keeping in mind that uh, it, might be it is happening somewhere else, and it's not happening only with China. So, why does it matter? If you are from China, uh, it is important to understand. Well, here is Tajbot, the guy who killed us, but it's on something else. <laughs> so, uh, the for for China, it is Chinese people. It's uh, important to see the significance of the current trend because it's not something that is just maybe marginal. It is something that has a, a, a specific meaning, and. Understanding the current trend can actually uh, help uh, have a strategic outlook to complement what is going on for China. And the last point, which might be very important, is that actually if there is a non-environmental shift, if the game is changing somehow, it's better to be aware of it, especially when you have been successful in the past, because it is something that will help you design your strategy for the future. Well, for traditional players, by traditional players, I mean uh, what is called in general the West, uh, let's say the US, France, United Kingdom, and all the powers who, usually, who have traditionally been, or what, I'm, what am I doing? The question for them is to know whether there is actually something new. Uh, is China something really new, or is it just an actor uh, as any other, as the other they have seen before? Uh, one interesting question is, what drives China's success in Africa? Because it has been, uh, it is being seen as a successful story, and the figures will be here to show it. And the last point about that is, is there any need to make strategic adjustment to adapt also to what's going on, and maybe adopt no policies or anything? Uh, if you are from the countries that are, let's say, the new players or the would-be players in Africa, of course you have all the countries such as India, Malaysia, or Brazil, uh, Turkey was playing a role like that. But also you even have countries such as Japan, 
uh, war is not a, uh, an emerging country, but Japan has not been that present, uh, much present in Africa over the, the past years, and is actually looking at what China is doing. Your first question is, yes, what's going on? What's going on? Why uh, does Africa acquire some kind of relevance, uh, and why China is going af after it? You could say that what's good for the goose is good for the gander. So you, you might think that if you are an emerging country in the same situation as China and they are doing it, maybe it is, there is something useful or interesting that they are going to fetch there and you might be interested in going for the same thing. And shadowing a poten potential rival. I'm putting rival into brackets, but it's not made that it is a direct rivalry over the world. But uh, in specific countries, you can have uh, China's, Chinese actors competing with Brazilian actors or Indian actors, so you can be interested to know uh, about that. If you are not that, and if you are not an African player, as it were, from, what is your interest? One is that similar games are being played elsewhere, so you, you might be from an, quite another area. Maybe you are seeing a lot of China, or a lot of other regional actors like Russia, for instance, if you are from, the, from Eastern Europe. And studying the best, best practice that uh, you can find in African countries about trade and investment with China might help you think about that. And there is one last point, which is that uh, you might be vying for export and capital, because uh, the thing is that you have the, let's say, the powerful countries they also have the capital, they have the capabilities to help an economy develop. And investors are looking for places where they can make money. And so the fact is that if you are considering which country in Africa are having the best result on that, looking at what they are doing might give you an indication also of about what you might do or what you might better regarding your own situation. And last, if you are an African, the answer is quite obvious. Uh, you could say that if you had a football game in your living room, you better know uh, what, it, what it is. So what, what game is, is it? What's going on? Uh, what are the stakes? Uh, and by the stakes, uh, you have to be thoughtful. It is what we can make out of it and what we could lose about it. So you have the, the, the two aspects uh, when you consider when you are considering states. And the last thing is that actually if the playing field is your house, as it were, to put it that way, you should be rising up to set, to set the rules. So you should position yourself as a referee on, on, in that game, uh, trying to understand what are the rules, but trying to direct the game. So that is uh, maybe one of the interests uh, from an African standpoint. Well, so what has changed? We'll go over quite a few facts. So Africa is increasingly central in China's international strategy. And this is not uh, as banal as it might seem, because it is the fact that it is central in the strategy. It's not uh, marginal. It's not on only marginal. Uh, when you look at the development of <coughs> trade in Africa, of China's trade in Africa, the figures are just self-telling. You see, uh, in 10 years from 1999 to, uh, 1990, uh, to 2010, it was times 20. So it is just a huge development. Uh, but the second point that is maybe even more interesting for me is that when you look at China's outward investments, you see that Sub-Saharan Africa and a part of North Africa, I will come back to that point later, is quite a, an important slice of the pie. It is not that it's not balanced, but it is relevant to considering what they are doing. So it is not a, just a marginal aspect of the strategy. And this has some importance because it, when you are doing some, some, something marginal, it does not matter. So what you are doing does not matter that much. Uh, failure or success is not that important. When something is in the core of your strategy, of course, you are supposed to take care of it. Uh, here is a map of the world. 
I have one question, where, where is the West? Because when you look at this, you start thinking that actually it makes sense. Uh, there is not that huge distance between China and Africa because the fact is that uh, the way we usually look at the map, we just uh, see extremes as if it was something, it is just a representation. But for China, uh, having a strategy in Asia, in Asia and then going to Africa is just something that could make sense in that respect. So China has quickly emerged as a go-to guy for trade and investment across Africa. Uh, for those who are not familiar with sports, uh, usually, especially food, American football or anything, you have your go-to guy, which it is like, okay, I'm the quarterback, I don't see, it's not clear, mm -hmm. I'm confused, I look at my guy and I go to him because I, he's, he's the guy I trust. China is increasingly becoming that in Africa. Uh, you see, sometimes, because when you do that, sometimes you should not actually. Sometimes you are throwing interception because they are covered, but it is a reflex. And it is what China has been becoming in Africa. Uh, they have, uh, they managed to reach a position where most countries, when they have things to do, they think China first. And so it is something important. Sorry, yeah? When you had that slide with the 316 billion total investment, mm -hmm. did that include internal investment in China or just worldwide outside of China? Outside, outside. outside. Uh, so this is just a comparison to say also what, what has changed. Uh, the US are traditionally one of the big actors in the in, in Africa, and just picking up one figure, actually this is from the website of uh, a senator from Delaware, uh, and you see uh, how is the trajectory of China. So the, the percentage by itself is not telling that much because they started from a, a, a larger point. But anyway, you have at least the raw, the raw figure and the, the, the size of the curve that tells you something. Uh, he did the same thing for trade. That the first one, as you see, was only for exports, exports to Africa. And this is uh, for overall trade. And you see also that uh, the trend has been the same, which means that uh, China is not only on exports, but it is about exports and, and import when you look at the trade, at, at the, at the trade on, on that aspect. Uh, what has changed, another thing, is that the traditional first uh, aid first approach has lost relevance for economic growth matters in, in Africa. And don't uh, get me wrong, I will not do the wrong thing this time. I think that, uh, yes, experience is good. Uh, so, uh, it's, I'm not meaning that aid is not important. It is to say that now the way it is considered, uh, aid is not seen anymore as something that will bring to development. It is not something that is considered as being of matter uh, when it comes to economic growth matter, matters. It has uh, its role to play, but it's not seen in the same context. And this, uh, the figures are a little old, but I think it's very interesting. It's from McKinsey showing the composition of foreign, foreign investment, to put it like, let's say capital inflows uh, in Africa uh, over the years. And what is interesting to see is the debt and other, let's say the official part has been take, uh, of a lower and lower size over the time. And what has been increasing is foreign, is foreign direct investment and equity. So it means we could interpret it in some aspects as saying that private investment, non-official investment, we should say that, uh, is taking uh, over. It's, uh, when we mention non-official, that's important because the way it is done is that the official uh, is only the operation from the central bank. So when it comes to China, 
actually, uh, if a, China, a Chinese uh, public held company invests, it, is, it comes in this category. It's not considered in the, uh, in the official portion. So it's not all private, but it, it is not official aid, let's say, from the, from the central. What has changed? Uh, you see the net direct investment trajectory of Africa from 1999. It is just, uh, there is no use to comment it anymore, any longer. You see just how investment has been playing a role that is quite unseen. Uh, and China is playing here a driving role because I put it that way. I say because China understands Africa, and at least when it comes to trade and, and investment. Because this is not Africa. You, you can, if you look at it, you see two things. First, but it was just, it is because I picked it, but you see it is about HIV AIDS, but it could be about poverty, it could be about anything. It is like uh, there is a trend to see Africa as a whole and to see it only in compartmented negative way instead of weighing in the good and the bad aspect or the positive and the other aspects. The other thing that is even more important for me is that this thing about sub-Saharan Africa, I think that it is of no kind of relevance because I have never heard speaking about, uh, I don't know, sub nevadan America. Nevada is a desert, Sahara is a desert. So it conveys an, an idea that uh, there is something different in North Africa and the converse idea is that, okay, yeah, the, uh, South Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, so it might be the same. But if you are in Northern Mali, you are actually closer to Algeria than you are, close, than you are to South Africa, and it is self-telling. So the, when it, you are dealing about Africa as a whole, it does not make sense to speak about Sub-Saharan Africa versus Northern Africa. It's a continent, it's just, you can pick some other area for greater analysis, but the, that point, I'm mentioning it because it has something to do with the idea of considering, and it is what we'll see here. This is Africa, what does it tell us? It is 54, sometimes five when people count uh, uh, its political issue, but well, the count is not set. Uh, well. But uh, it is a mosaic of countries, of course. It is a continent, and that should be obvious, but, but it's not obvious. For us in general, let's say, I was in Europe, and we would think uh, evident that uh, someone from Norway is different for, uh, than someone, somebody from Italy. But in Africa, we don't think that, uh, let's say, somebody from Senegal is different than somebody from Kenya. We don't, just don't feel it that way. Uh, and it is something, uh, in China's approach, uh, one of the things that they are doing is that they are not dealing with the continent. They have an African strategy, but they are dealing on a country per country basis. And that is something that has huge result because you, 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 you should not deal the same way. With, and actually, when we are outside, we are all brothers. But even inside, we are not that much brothers, which is not a good thing. But, which is not a good thing, but that's, that's the reality. Uh, so beyond the obvious, or back to the obvious, you could say, say it either way. So one point is that oh, China is just a country, yeah, which is obvious. And, as a country, it is taking care of its own interest. And I add that, that is fair and fine enough. Why? Because uh, most of the critics that you will see about China is that, oh, guy, you should beware, because you know these Chinese, they are not here to help you. Well, obviously, they, they are not supposed to be here to, to help us. And it is like, we should start from obvious things and build on that rather than uh, going the opposite way, which is a way of sometimes having uh, different standards when we come to judging, uh, let's say, the same operation. Uh, another point is that, so you have one 
plain answer and multiple applications. It is one plain answer because uh, there is, a, as it were, an African strategy for China, if you can put it that way. But we have seen that it is a country per country ap approach. Uh, for the countries, the point is, uh, I put it that way, let's not fear China's presence. Let's leverage China's interest. And it is on purpose that I say, let's leverage China's interest. We should consider, when looking, dealing with the issue, that the best protection we have is the, uh, China's interest, actually. And it's a good thing that there is an interest. Is when you have make a loan, interest is good. So in general, people consider that mutual interest is a good thing for a deal. So we should not be thinking or, or be, be primed into thinking that when it comes to dealing with Africa, what is good is benevolent, uh, non-interested approach. No, it's not, that's not exactly the case, at least not for the matters we are dealing with here. Uh, Beyond the obvious, is China all Africa? Obviously, no. Uh, this is the share of African, Africa's share in, tot, in China's total export and import. So you see it's rising, but you see we are talking about what? 5%, 5%. So it is not like if Africa was, let's say, 50% or I don't know, of China's total trade. It is one area among others. So China is about something and in Africa. And this may qualify sometimes also a, a perception people may have, might have being that, OK, China is after African resources. It's not like uh, they could not do uh, anything uh, without, without some of those things. It is a strategic interest, but it is not maybe a survival I issue, at, at least not an Im immediate survival issue. Uh, is Africa all China? Obviously, no. Uh, here you see uh, foreign trade investment. So I use an another category here in Africa, uh, depending on uh, from uh, receipts, depending on the countries. And actually, I have seen that uh, at, at present, the biggest uh, for foreign direct investments. I'm talking, speaking here only about foreign direct investment. In Africa, uh, it, it was France uh, in, as of uh, to, uh, 2011. And it, is, it has been published recently by the United Nations. So it is still France. The number two is the US. And the number three, who is the number three? China. Malaysia. Wow. So even not the first ASEAN. China, Malaysia has 19 point uh, something mil million, and China is number four with, with 16, and India is number five with uh, 14. It tells you a lot, in, 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 in particular two things. Malaysia, ob obviously, Petronas has to do a lot with it. And it's, if it is Petronas, it's all related. But you will not hear around Malaysia is after African oil. But if it was China, or when it is China, that is something that we tend to say. China is Africa after African oil. So seeing some, what is happening sometimes, it, it is surprising. Sometimes it surprises you. And it can help uh, qualify what's going on. Uh, sorry, yeah? Now, that, that number is, is the sourcing of that number, does that include private monies? Is there somewhere to track private monies? Yeah, this one is, yes, the, the, exactly. It's the foreign direct and, uh, uh, investment, uh, but not, not, not the remittances. You are mentioning the remittances. It includes private investment uh, from companies and investment from public uh, hold, held companies less like, like, like China. But it, it does not in, include, for instance, money I would be sending back home, this, this statistic, this one. Uh, what I'm doing. Yeah. Another question. Will China or anyone develop Africa? Of course, no. And that is not an expectation we should be having. That's another point. It is like, hey, hey, hey beware, the China, they will not develop. Of course, they will not. It is not their role to do that. Uh, that is something also that we need to keep in mind. And but we'll come to that in the conclusion. 
And is China a pivotal opportunity for Africa? This time, yes. Because what is a, that's why I'm speaking about a game changer. Uh, if you look, I, I re can remember, uh, let's say, because I'm not that young. So uh, when I started, let's say, 15 years ago, something like that, uh, in France, uh, working in the private sector, they would mention trade or anything in all, all the continents without, without even mentioning Africa once. And I was like, what? Trade figures you don't hear about. Because Africa was not relevant. It was not relevant. That is not something that you can see anymore. Because it has become relevant for two reasons. For the sheer size of what China, but others, as we have seen, India, Malaysia, are, are doing. But also because it has induced a kind of competition. Because people are like, OK, it's not like taken for granted anymore. So I'm not like, if I'm France, I have my former colonies, so, and I, I can go there whenever I want. It has something that is changing. It's like they have alternative options now. So it changes the way people uh, have to position themselves. So beyond the obvious, I, I call them the five and one assets that China brings uh, to the field. One thing is uh, the, they think opportunity and not constraint. Uh, I was watching, for instance, a, a McKinsey debate uh, on, on that. And people uh, were trying to analyze in South Africa, trying to analyze what was, what was going on. And uh, one of the partners was, was saying that, uh, you see, for instance, you, the big problem in Africa for doing business is the cost, because the infrastructure is not here. But people in general will say, OK, we cannot do business there because there is no infrastructure and no cost. And the Chinese approach will be, in general, OK, there is no infrastructure. This is something we can do. So th that is a way of thinking. Uh, and once again, I'm saying China. I'm not meaning they are the only one doing that, of course, obviously. But it is just to antagonize, but to show what is, let's say, salient in their ap approach. And that is something of a game changer. I will not come back to the country per country approach. I have mentioned that. And not just pricing strategy. Of course, if I don't have any money, I would rather buy a bike than dream of a Ferrari. And so people sometimes will question the quality of China's product. And to some extent, it can be true. But for the African market as it is now, with the capacity people have to purchase, if you design goods as they should be and not as they can be pur purchased, actually, those goods at least will not be doing any good. So uh, this is maybe the crucial point. Uh, they leverage resources endowment. And here I'm actually uh, building on Deborah Bortigam's. It, uh, she, she, she was fam famous. She, has written, uh, an American uh, researcher has written The Dragon's Gift and has started early on saying, hey, guys, we should be looking better when we are considering what China is doing. And one of the things she is mentioning is that uh, when you go back a few years ago, a few, let's say a few decades ago, actually, so let's say 30 years ago or in the, even more, I'm getting old. Uh, China was not what it is now. And Japan was what China is now. And she's mentioning that one thing that they did was that Japan had limited resources, small, small country. Uh, one of the deals they made with China, and it is important to mention it because you cannot say that Chinese-Japanese relations have been historically good, but it was shared interest. They tell them, OK, we have the technology, we have the capital. You have resources, so let's use our technology and your resources. So we will be bringing, uh, building things in China, transferring our technology, and you will get us resources from, from that. And it was seen as a balanced deal because uh, it was saying that maybe you don't have the cash to pay, but you have some other kind of riches, riches and it is a, a way to leverage it. And 
when you look at it, uh, it is just what China is doing in many places in Africa. And it is saying, OK, you don't have money, but you have oil. Or you don't have money. Sometimes it's peanuts. In, when you I mean peanuts in the sense of peanuts, not, not in the sense of nothing. <laughs> uh, when you take uh, Senegal, which is my country, you have uh, China asset back deals that are backed with peanuts. Uh, so you cannot say that, uh, OK, that peanut is strat of huge strategy for China. But it is a way to say it has some value. And that value can be leveraged to do something. So this is something of an approach that can be seen as the glass is full empty or the glass is half, half empty or half anything, half full. Uh, because you could be saying, OK, guys, uh, China is taking resources for money. And, but if you look at what they are doing uh, in many places, it's not that anything, everything is good. But the way they are doing things, actually, they are, at least you can say that they are doing nothing more than what Japan has done for them, and that they rate as being something that has played a role in their development. So it is something that they think is a leverage that will allow them to get what they want because they have something to bring. Uh, this other one is very good. They build infrastructure. Uh, my personal view is that it is very difficult to put a road in a bank account in Switzerland. So if China comes and say, OK, let's make a deal, and it, instead of paying you with money, I, I will build the road, actually people will be benefiting from it. In the more traditional operations, we have seen how African leaders in general have been doing with, with, with the money. Uh, actually, uh, for over years, you have studies on that, saying that Africa has been for many years a net capital uh, exporter, but not in the normal flow of investment, but in the flow of private saving elsewhere. Uh, building the infrastructure is something that is important because it creates some kind of leverage. You should know how to manage it, obviously. But uh, the approach by itself is something that creates uh, a potential for, for the people because the infrastructure, when it's here, it's a public good. It's for everybody. Uh, when you make an operation with, and I, I'm not mentioned, saying also that uh, China is not giving cash to any leader. It's not the point. But maybe even if they might be doing that and building the road, at least the road will be here. So it is some, and it is something that African people usually appreciate. Uh, and the last point that is a little contra controversial, that could be, but I will get clear about it. That's why I put 5%, is that no government's delu governance delusion. Uh, because China's approach in general, which is criticized, is to say we are not going into the, the issues of the, of the state. But when you look from a, a historical uh, perspective, in my view, it is a progress. Because it's not like if uh, the powerful state were not tampering with what was going on. Uh, of course, during the Cold War, you could say there was a good reason, because it was like, who is for us and who is against us? But to take a few, I don't mean to be politically incorrect or anything. But I think it is safe to say that when you take Mobutu of Zaire, he does not qualify as a good leader. Yet, he was put there, of course because he was considered as a barrier against communism. And you could make a uh, very long list. And even recently, uh, when you take the Arab Spring, uh, I was in Paris at that, at that time. It started in Tunisia. The first reflex of the, uh, it was Elizabeth Gigou, who was French minister of uh, uh, in the interior. Her first reflex was to say, OK, Mr. Ben Ali, would you want us to send uh, let's say, policemen in order to maintain peace. What was going on there? It was like, OK, Tunisia is very stable. And uh, then again, not to mention whether the revolution was spontaneous or anything. I'm not going in that into that deba debate. But what is sure is that the approach generally was not, I'm neutral about what you are doing, whatever you are doing. It is, no, if there is somebody who actually uh, defends our interests, at least in terms of stability, we will be protecting that guy. And so I think that uh, from that point of view, saying that I, I'm cynical about that, I, I am helping the guy who is here. If he's gone, I come. It's, it is an upgrade. And a last point maybe about that, Equatorial Guinea. Uh, 
they, have, they are very small, they have a lot of oil. If you, it's my personal judgment, if you made a top three or five, or let's say five at maximum ranking of bad governance in Africa, I could uh, bet anybody that they should be there because the oil is just like kind of, but it is ExxonMobil who is there over the year. And now what they are saying is that oh, we have Chinese competition. So that's what, why I say avoiding the delusion is that, okay, no, we, don't, we know that it's not about that. It's about interest. So let's cope with that. And for me, paradoxically, even this is a good thing uh, because it is uh, something that uh, warrants let's, uh, an, approach, an approach that is more, less naive, less naive, I will put it that way. Uh, so, beyond the obvious last point, game mismanagement is not a recipe for success anywhere. This one, I think, it is the play of last year, last second, crucial play, one signaling that there is an incompletion, the other one saying there is a touchdown. It, change, it changes the face of the, of the playoff uh, from, on a very controversial basis. And this is not good. So, if African people are supposed to be the rulers of the game being played on their field, and if they are supposed to be doing things, mismanagement will not lead them anywhere with anybody. So in that uh, sense, even excess, there are a few excess or a lot of excess from Chinese actors, but also from French actors, from US actors, anything. Even that excess, in some point it tells you that there is an issue about the management of, of, the, of the thing. And actually, you have improvement because the competition around and pe people getting more and more aware. I think that when you look overall, you are having better deals. The deals that are being signed now, in particular with China, for instance, will include more of local people working there and a lot of things uh, it is, people are learning. So what I could say as a conclusion is that China and Africa, let's not fear China's presence. It is a good thing. But let's try to leverage China's interest because it is an occasion uh, for Africa to be at least relevant in the game. So as an occasion, it has upside and downside. And it is up to African people to try to do the good thing about that. And I'm done. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question regarding your last slide, let's not fear China's presence. Mm -hmm. To me, it appears that the domestic industry of Africa is not that established. Mm -hmm. And in unestablished economy, you have opened almost all of the Africa yeah. to the entire world, not mm -hmm. just China, I'm not blaming China. Mm -hmm. So don't you think it's an economic suicide for Africa mm -hmm. that you are just in in an end-producing consumers, mm -hmm. not producers. Mm. So. Yeah, that's a, a, a very good question, actually. Because uh, when I say, let's not fear China's presence, whenever you look at Africa, and that is something you have mentioned, you should look at what was the alternative, <coughs> what was the next best option. And it is not like uh, African states were there without uh, any other uh, country doing something in, in, in there. So the option of saying that, uh, obviously you can say that, for instance, if you open the country and you are not strong uh, industrially, you will not be benefiting from that, at least for, for some moment. But at the same time, this was what was happening, or even worse, because if uh, China is not here to play the role, what was happening was that uh, or it was being played by somebody else, or uh, you would have uh, the resources lying fallow and without being exploited. So it is like, uh, when you say, it is like there is an issue, actually. It is something that is momentous, but you have no choice than you need to manage it. It is not like African states have the option of closing themselves and doing anything together in between, and it's not even sure that it would be good, a good thing. So to come to the, to the light, last point, uh, it means that what I say from China here, 
is the same. I could put India, could put Brazil, the US, France. I could put everybody, everybody here. It is to say that, OK, you are responsible for the management of what you are doing. And if you are engaging in trade with somebody else, it's up to you to look at what is your interest. And so the fact of having many options, actually, it should remain many options. So it should not be also uh, China, 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 or India, 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 India. No, no, no. It is like I try to consider for any operation what's the, better, the best deal, and what are the policy measures that I should be taking also in order to address such failures that, uh, than the one you are considering. Yeah? Let's talk about Ghana's mm -hmm. experience with security mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. And I'll say they use both illegal and illegal methods. Mm -hmm. Protocols and protocols. That's right. Mm -hmm. For example, if you look at the mining sector in Ghana, mm -hmm. we've got uh, the illegal miners, which they call the galaxy of mm -hmm. And what the Chinese do mm -hmm. is they bring in their heavy equipment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Likewise, African leaders mm -hmm. 
because of the nature of, I mean, they are, they are not transparent. Yeah. Also, want to deal with mm -hmm. the Chinese mm -hmm. because the systems dealing with the Chinese are not yeah. pro functioning properly. Mm -hmm. I I uh, I would qualify the this uh, in one of two points. Of course, the the main point is the point on which we agree. It is that mismanagement, and the fact is to know that is China creating a bigger opportunity for mismanagement. It is not obvious. It's not obvious everywhere, because. Uh, for oil, if you take another example, if you take the oil in Gabon and the way it is mismanaged, it is by total France for years and years. So mismanagement on that aspect is not like if China, China is doing something that nobody was doing, which is not good. But it means that uh, the idea that China is uh, creating an opportunity for that, uh, for me it is, even given, it is given too much confidence to most of our, our, our our leaders, because most of them, they are very, quite creative when it comes to mismanaging. So even if there is no China, they, can, they often find ways to get, but it is a side comment. Uh, about the bids, that is something that you have all over the, the place. You have actually, China has a pricing strategy. That's the first point. And the second point is that uh, for some categories of goods, let's say, if you put aside some who are very, very heavy in technology where the West is above, in many categories, actually, China can make something at lower cost, which is an, 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 an advantage. But you can have two remarks to qualify the perspective that they are dealing with our leaders because uh, of cor corruption. One is that, actually, it is not like if China is not winning b bids elsewhere. They are also winning bids in other places. And when you take Africa, uh, they are doing a lot in Ethiopia, for instance. Ethiopia is not looking like the most mismanaged country in Africa. But another point is that when you take the bids by the African Development Bank, for instance, uh, most of the bids that they do, a, a great bulk of that in infrastructure is also won by Chinese companies. And that, at least, you could say that if it is not, yes, you can say a lot of things about the African Development Bank, but at least the fact that there is all those guys watching around from different countries makes the procedure a little more transparent that it will be in, in one country or another. All this does not mean that, they, they, of course, there have been huge problems uh, overall. But my point about that is that uh, when you have, for instance, Chinese people doing illegal things, it is not China doing it. And it, because when in Senegal, when we catch, uh, 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 let's say, a French dealer, we, we are not saying French is, deal, is dealing drug in Senegal. And that is that idea, I think, that it is, some, it is something we have to be cautious about. Because when a Chinese company does something, even if there are others that are not doing that, we tend, and me included, we tend to be thinking, OK, you see, this is what they are, they are doing. And I think it is something. So you have to have a balanced approach, but it starts with management. That's the first, that the, that the point. Chinese government. Hmm? When Ghana deported the illegal mm -hmm. miners, mm -hmm. the Chinese government also put up restrictions on Ghana's travel to China. <laughs> and also running up hmm? a many plans to yeah, China thinking that like, I mean, it's politics and diplomatics. <laughs> It is just like in, in the time you catch two, three of our, our spies, okay, we have three spies, okay, give us four. And it is, uh, I, I, what, what I mean by that is that uh, we, do not ex we should not expect China to, to fare better than others on, on that aspect. Be, in the diplomatic relation, you close an embassy, they close yours. If, even if you, 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 were, you did it right, right, righteously. If you, so it is something that is another game, but that is a, the game of, let's say, politics and diplomacy. And if, if, if you take, uh, let's say, thousands of China and you de deport them saying that they, they are doing wrong things, you might expect that the China, Chinese government will react from one point to another, regardless of the relevance of, 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 of what you did. But that also is not an exception. It's, it is what everybody is, is doing, more or less. You, uh, it is something else. I will not bring it in. in but you have the spying issue now uh, in, in Europe. It is not like it is. It's not unseen. People know that uh, 
of course, people, governments spy on each other. But once you, when you caught, catch some, somebody, you need to do the political and, and diplomatic game, saying, hey, guys, what you are doing is wrong. And they say, no, this guy is, and it's the, just the way it is. But everybody knows that it is, they are spying on each other. So, yeah. In terms of jobs, mm -hmm. and local jobs, domestic yeah. jobs, mm -hmm. uh, the Chinese uh, shoot themselves in the foot by not hiring locals very much? They used to do that. And, and, and this is, uh, that's a question that is very relevant to the point of interest. Because at some point, most of the uh, in, critic of China from African, African people, say, came from that point. So now, when you look at the later deals, uh, they are far way b best structured. When you look at the deals in southern, uh, the southern region, I think they are doing a better job uh, than Western Africa, for instance. You have a lot of deals when they, they will say, for instance, no more than 15% uh, or less uh, Chinese workers in the management, no more than percentage. And it is something that Chinese uh, companies are quite willing to do because they are, uh, if, it is, if they have to go for that, they will do it. It, it, they will not come and offer you uh, just to take your, your, your workers because they might be preferring doing it with, with their, own, their own. But it is actually one of the leverage that people have, and they have be, it, it has been used better. When you look at the, the most recent deals, uh, actually, almost all of them include a uh, huge proportion of local, of local, local, because China, as you say, they have seen that uh, going on that trend would be shooting them on the foot. And that is what I was saying at the beginning, saying that their interest about looking that is seeing if the game is shifting, they need also to monitor whatever strategy they, they were having. So, so six or eight years ago it was 10% of local workers, and now it's like 30% minimum or something? Actually, I, I have been quite surprised. So somehow, I, I think it is in Sierra Leone, and I don't want to put up the countries I don't have, but I have seen somewhere the, the number was quite, quite small, something like 10% or less. So, but it is, then again, it is, it depends on the country. If you don't ask for it, you will not get it. And it is, it tells, I think, more about the capacity of negotiation and the willingness to do it and to do it for the purpose. Because sometimes, <laughs> sometimes we, we undermine the capacity of negotiations of, African, uh, of some African leaders, I should say some. Uh, it is not that they are not negotiating well. It is that what they are negotiating is not necessarily the common interest. So you could say, OK, instead of negotiating uh, the number of workers, I will negotiate uh, a palace for myself and money. And, and Chinese companies, uh, they, are, they can't do either. They can't go either way, to what I have seen. Yeah? Uh, you know that some uh, Asian countries and also some African countries mm -hmm. uh, are culturally skeptical about uh, the things happening in their country. Yeah, a lot. They, they see some politics behind every event. Yeah. So my question is whether this increasing trade and foreign direct investment mm -hmm. by China and the African countries mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Do you think do you think that it is all about a simple economics and all about yeah. things are going or do you see some political uh, yeah. strings and political design yeah. behind all this investment? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, obviously, that is a point I, I have not mentioned uh, because uh, I do not want to go far away. But there is a, a clear political design. And one of the things is that uh, when you look at China, where, where China stands now, uh, they, they, re they have reached a point where, want, the, want it or not, they are considered as a great power in the world. And I mean in, in, also in, in political ways. So just an example, when you look at uh, rapt of uh, China work, Chinese workers in, in, uh, in conflict places in Africa, uh, usually uh, China had a policy saying that uh, people take care of their own risk. They were not intervening. But now there are so many of Chinese working there, and they are being targeted uh, by, let's say, pirates or anything then the government has been forced to change that aspect. So there is a, there is a, a diplomatic thing, and, and, and China is obvi obviously considering, which is true, that, that uh, Africa is maybe, people say, the frontier, last frontier or anything, just as an economy. It is the one of the easiest place to take, as it were. But then again, uh, when I'm considering that, and it is what I'm do doing anyway, I I'm saying, what is the alternative? 
And it is not like the alternative was that African uh, states were self-determining uh, mining. And when you take, uh, for instance, uh, Francophone Africa, the part I am from, uh, you, whenever you went to the United Nations and there was a vote, France would vote white and the old 23 would vote white the same way. They would vote black. They all would, because also it was something that France were leveraging as a matter of diplomatic power. And China is doing that. So uh, it is something we need not to be naive about. But another point, maybe a last point, which is relating, China is also, and that is, the, they are actually doing, uh, they are adjusting what they do. Uh, when you look at peacekeeping in Africa, actually even Ban, Ban Ki-moon said it, uh, something like uh, to when he was in, in charge in the United Nations, He's, this is an area where China stands tall. Because uh, in, when you look at the, uh, the peacekeeping in Africa, China has been taken the greatest bulk uh, in, in, let's say, in the period uh, of two, two, 2000 to 2010. So, and then again, it's not just about being kind. It is because it matters uh, in terms of influence. It matters in terms of, uh, yes, but you are perfectly right. It is something people need to, 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 to be about. And maybe the last comment is, that's the reason why uh, Africa should not be sold to China. And if I'm giving the, that impression, actually, it is a wrong impression. Because, no, it is to qualify a wrong view about it. But Africa should not be sold to China, as it should not be sold to France or to, uh, to anybody, or to the US. We have yeah. one more quick question. OK. Uh, do, you, do you think that the Aosanish problems uh, being solved uh, by this kind of investment of foreign trade in Africa, or mm -hmm. uh, rich people is getting richer mm -hmm. in Africa? Yeah. Uh, that, yes and no, <laughs> because uh, it depends most of the country first. And when you say that, you say, okay, it depends on the kind of operation the country has had. When you look at, there are some, many places where people are not deriving anything from what China is doing, but really not from whatever the government might be doing. But you have uh, places, and I think that when you take, for instance, Kenya, Ethiopia, just to give the two examples, uh, uh, two kind, I, I'm giving those countries because it's not, they are not resource countries, because you have other countries like Angola, but you would say there is the oil. But those kind of countries, they are doing a lot with China, and actually importing, exporting, doing trade and exchanging, and having even China companies invest there and, and, and uh, hire workers. So it, is, it comes down to what uh, the, 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 the government or whatever the leadership is doing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks.